Okay, it's two o'clock. Welcome everybody to the first uh, Learn with BT webinar, RF measurements in a CATV system. My name is Liz Rappley. I'm the Director of Marketing for Blonder Tongue. And uh, I'm happy to welcome everybody to this webinar. I will be monitoring all of the questions that come up via what, as you raise your hand or if you use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will answer all the questions at the end of the session. And um, I will turn it over now to Wes Waite, who is our instructor of many years and of great acclaim. Wes, it's all you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, again, hi, welcome everybody. Um, like, like Liz said, my name is Wes Waite, uh, senior systems engineer. And we're going to go through RF measurements in a cable television system today, talking about what levels should be measured for analog and digital uh, television channels, and what performance metrics uh, should be measured along with the, the actual levels of those channels to uh, maintain the health of the system. So we're going to start out with looking at the end points or the, the final locations. Uh, this would be a television set, a set top box. This could even be if you have a rack of equipment that is receiving signal. This could be the uh, demodulators or uh, processors. But these are the, the devices that are receiving signals. So analog RF signals should be measured between plus 5 and plus 15 dB MV, decibel millivolts. Again, that's measured at the input to the device, the analog television location, processor, demodulator, set-top box, what have you. Uh, FCC has a minimum rating of 0 dB MV or 3 dB MV for cable companies at the end of a 100-foot run of cable. Uh, we pad that a little bit, make that a little bit higher, and say the low should be about a plus five, so that way if a customer happens to throw in a two-way splitter or something, you still have sufficient signal to meet FCC minimum and maintain a good picture. Uh, the 15 dBMV high end is just through our experience, 60 plus years of experience in the industry, um, what we've found to be a suitable high-end level for most of the products out there. Uh, for digital signals, digital RF signals include 8BSB, the off-air format, and QAM64 or QAM256, the digital cable TV format. They should be between a minus 5 dBMV and a plus 5 dBMV at the receiver. Again, the receiver being a television, a processor, demodulator, whatever. So if we have a mixed system where we have both analog and digital signals on the system, the digital signals typically run uh, relative to the analog video carrier. The digital signals typically run 6 to 10 dB lower than that analog video carrier to uh, make sure there's no interference between the, the analog and digital signals and everybody is playing nice together. Now, the one thing I didn't mention was amplifiers because they have a whole different set of rules or, or suggestions for what their input levels should be. Um, and if you look at specs on any amplifier, not just blunt or tongue amplifiers, but any cable TV amplifier, you will not find a, a rated input level on the specs. The uh, short answer is the input level to an amplifier is going to be the high level output rated output level minus the gain of the amplifier. So for example, with the Beta Series 86A, which is an 860 megahertz amplifier with 30 dB of gain, the rated output is 3644, meaning 36 dBmV out on channel 2, 44 dBmV out on channel 135, or 860 megahertz. 
So we take that 44 dB of output minus the 30 dB of gain that that amplifier gives us, and we find we have about a 14 dBmV minimum input level. That's the level we need to hit that amplifier with to achieve the 44 out. And of course, when we talk about amplifiers in another segment, we'll dive deeper into amplifiers and talk about how we get that 36 and 44 dBmV output and whatnot. But right now we're just talking about the inputs. Okay, so if we have more than a 2 dB higher input level, so for more than 16 dBmV into that amplifier, we want to use plug-in modules. There are plug-in attenuator location and equalizer location to reduce those levels. Another example would be the same series, the Bita 86A, this time with a 43 dB gain. It has the same rated output level, 36 over 44 dBmV output. So we take that 44 high level output minus the 43 dB gain. That unit requires a minimum of a plus one dBmV on the input side to achieve the rated output. If the incoming RF signals are all analog or all digital, the signals must be as flat, meaning equal level, as possible. So from channel 2 to all the way through channel 135 on an 860 megahertz system, we want to hit that amplifier as evenly as possible across all the frequencies. Uh, if the incoming RF signals are a mix of analog and digital, again, like I said in the first slide, the digitals want to be run 6 to 10 dB lower than the analog video carrier. So you can see the little uh, drawing example at the bottom of the slide there where I have the analog channels at plus 14 dBmV, the digital channels in green at plus 7 dBmV, um, running into a 30 uh, decibel gain amplifier. So although the digitals are run about 7 dB lower than the analogs, they're still all flat relative to each other. This chart shows, uh, just shows the range uh, in dBmV of the digital input range typical to a tune television tuner and the analog input range also. Also compares it to uh, microvolt and microwatt measurements. So we can see that in the, in the decibel world, decibels are a logarithmic uh, ratio level. So zero to three dBmV to go across to the microwatts, it goes from 0 0.013 microwatts to 0 0.026 microwatts. So 3 dB is a doubling of power in our world. So 3 dB is not a very large number that, that we think of it, but, but it is a, a, a doubling of energy, a doubling of power in the RF world. Some other uh, conversions or standards that you may see in systems or, or in, your, um, in your travels working with RF, uh, if you work with uh, microwave systems or Fiber optic systems, dBm is a standard for measurement for those types of systems. And you can see at the bottom there, conversion factors, zero dBm is equivalent to plus 48 decibel millivolts across 75 ohms. Uh, dBw is a format that the broadcasters use because they're transmitting such high levels. It's not typically something we use or or we'll see uh, in our measurements. And then finally, uh, dBUV or dB microvolts is a standard that's used overseas in Europe uh, and, and other countries. Uh, so we use D decibel millivolts. So zero decibel millivolts is equivalent to plus 60 dB microvolts across 75 ohms. So if you come up to a, you're in a distribution system and you come up to a wall plate and plug your meter in, your meter happens to have both millivolts and microvolts settings on it, and you're measuring, say, a plus 65, 
at that wall plate. Well, I certainly hope it's not 65 decibel millivolts you're measuring there. Um, if it is, there's other problems in the system. But uh, it, it would check, I would check first the setting of the standard that you're measuring, make sure it's not decibel microvolts. All right, some of the uh, things that compromise our signals. Um, noise is a big contributing factor to uh, decreasing the quality of our signals. Uh, noise typically comes along on the noise contributions comes from thermal noise generated by all electronics and most specifically amplifiers. So noise amplifiers have a, a setting called a noise figure, a, a um, specification that tells us how much noise that particular device is going to add to our system. So noise gets added to our signals at the input side of the amplifiers. I'm not gonna get into all the technical engineering aspect of it, but just know that the lower input level on the first stage of an amplifier is why the noise gets added to the input side of the amplifier. So if you have a lower input level, say, um, say we were comparing a 30 decibel gain amplifier to a 43 decibel gain amplifier, we just saw a couple slides ago that a 30 decibel gain amplifier requires a 14 decibel dBmV minimum input a 43 dB gain amplifier requires a minimum one dBmV input. So that in and of itself tells us that the 43 dB gain amplifier will add, will contribute more noise to our system than will a 30 dB gain amplifier. And here at the bottom is showing how we measure carrier to noise, the the noise floor, the grass at the bottom of a spectrum view of a analog channel relative to the peak of the video carrier on an analog signal. And the signal to noise ratio for a digital signal is the peak of the digital haystack down to the noise floor. So carrier to noise is the one of video carrier so the, the analog signal, the video, the video carrier compared to the system noise level. And there's a fairly simple uh, formula for that, figuring out the carrier to noise. 59 is a constant, the thermal noise of a 75 ohm resistor. So 59 minus the noise figure, again, that's specified for every amplifier out there, what the noise figure is. For the BITA series amplifiers, a broadband amplifier, it's listed at 8.5 decibels noise figure, plus the input level. So right here we can see a 30 dB gain amp with a 15 dBmV input level has about a 65 decibel carrier to noise ratio, meaning our carrier is 65 decibels higher than our noise floor. For the 43 dB gain amp with a plus one dBmV input, the carrier to noise reduces to 51. And then for the 50 dB gain amplifier, which uh, has a listed specified minus six dBmV input level, the carrier to noise is about 44 decibels coming out of one amplifier and that's 50 dB of gain. If we just jump down to the bottom of the slide there, the FCC minimum carrier to noise for analog to any outlet on your system is 43 dB. So if you have a 50 dB gain amplifier, one 50 dB gain amplifier in your system, you're right at the edge of that FCC minimum. And not only, you know, it, the FCC isn't gonna come necessarily knocking on your door and shut you down or fine you, but picture quality is going to be worse than it should be at that point because you have such low carrier to noise. Now for an amplifier cascade, meaning you have multiple amplifiers in your system 
And however many amps you go through from the start of your system to the furthest out uh, outlet would be the how many amplifiers you have in Cascade in your system. Uh, you can, there's a formula for that. There's also a chart available on our broadband reference guide. Uh, I put that page up here. So looking at, let's say I have four amplifiers in Cascade in series. If we go over to the second column there, we see that carrier noise drops by 6.02. So if, if I have four 30 decibel gain amplifiers in series, each individual amp contributes 65 dB carrier to noise. After going through all four of them, my overall carrier to noise gets worse by six. So my result, my furthest, after my fourth amplifier, my overall carrier to noise would be running about a 59 dB carrier to noise. Okay. Now, that, that's looking at amplifiers of all the same input level and gain rating. Now, if I look at a more real-world system where I have two amplifiers of different gains, different input levels, how do I figure out the character noise for that? Well, here I've got a, a 43 dB gain amplifier, which is typically the first amplifier used in a cable TV system because, again, the FCC says... The cable company has to provide you a minimum of zero or plus three after a 100 foot drop. So if I use a 43 dB gain amp with a plus one dB MV input, I've got my bases pretty much covered for being able to achieve that rated output of 3644. Then any subsequent amp in my system, I'm controlling the, the levels, I'm controlling when I reamplify. I'm going to drop in a 30 dB gain amp to maintain a decent carry to noise beyond that. So looking at the, the uh, formulas there below the amplifier number one, I've run through the numbers, and I wind up with that 43 dB gain amp, I wind up with a 51.5 dB carry to noise. That's measured anywhere after that first amplifier up to and including the input of amplifier number two. Now amplifier two gets my signal and adds its contribution. Well, standalone by itself, amplifier number two generates 65 dB carrier to noise. So it's better carrier to noise than amplifier number one. But overall, my noise can never get better in a system than what we start with. So after amplifier number one, my noise is coming out at 51.5 out of amplifier number one. It'll never get better than that in my system. It can only get worse. Because I have such a great difference between 51.5 and 65.5, the contribution of the second amplifier is very, very little. So let's look at the, the bottom paragraph here, the decibel difference between them is 14 dB. So I look at this 10 log D rate chart over on the right, and I go down to 14 on the left column, and I go across the columns, see the column header subtraction values there, to the 0 .00 column, because my difference between the numbers is 14.0. So I should find a subtraction value of a dot one seven. So my second amplifier is contributing less than two tenths of a decibel of, of noise to my overall system, basically is what that's saying. So I take that, the lower number, the 51.5, the starting carrier to noise number, deduct the dot one seven from my chart, and I wind up with 51.33, or round it off, 51.3 decibels carrier to noise overall after my second amplifier in this example. Distortions. Just, so noise, again, is contributed most heavily on the input side of the amp. Distortions are created on the output side of the amplifier. When we look at specifications on an amplifier, we look at the rated output level, we look at the distortions, those distortions are based on full channel loading, however many channels that amp can support, and the rated output level. 
So if that output level changes, the distortion quantity will change as well. Um, in, the, in the analog world, uh, composite triple beat is the most prevalent distortion there is. It's a summation of three uh, carriers. So in, in the, the graph here at the bottom, the spectrum analyzer view at the bottom, you've got the, the video carrier on the left. Then you've got the next peak is the color burst carrier and the, the rightmost peak is the audio carrier. Those three carriers live in every analog signal. When those, when those signals, when this channel goes through a amplifier, it will, these three carriers will beat together and create different products of distortions. That's how these little distortions are made. And these little colored lines underneath the carrier are representations of distortions that could be generated after going through an amplifier. It may not necessarily be evident on a spectrum analyzer view. They could be hidden directly under the carrier or under the, the video information, like the blue and the purple uh, lines are, but they are there and they will interfere with the, the signals. Uh, another uh, prevalent distortion is composite second order. It typically happens on VHF channels and creates diagonal lines in the picture. The composite triple beat shows up on an analog picture as graininess or worminess in the background of the picture. Other types of distortion, cross modulation, where you have one analog channel imposing itself, superimposing itself uh, directly onto another channel, kind of like ghosting, but it's a totally different program. Uh, hum is rolling bars, either one or two bars, clear to uh, whitish bars rolling up through the picture. If you see that, put one hand in your back pocket and proceed carefully. That's telling you that there is voltage on the line getting into that television tuner. So you gotta be careful with that. It could be uh, one, one bar would be 60 cycle hum, two bars would be 120 cycle hum. A lot of times it comes from a bad capacitor in a power supply. It could be a, could be the TV power supply. It could be an amplifier power supply. It could be Mrs. Jones's VCR power supply. Who knows? But something is, is throwing voltage back into the coax system. Um, and then the delta of life here is a, it's a balancing act. Uh, as you adjust for one thing, other things change as well. So carried noise, again, is on the input side of the amplifier. Composite triple beat and cross-modulation distortions are on the output side of the amplifier. But you really are adjusting the amplifier setup to balance for the best, the best possibility for both the sides. That's why they, kind of why they call it balancing. Uh, you're trying to balance the input and the output of the amplifier at the same time. Uh, as you see here, as the noise, as the input uh, changes, as the input goes 1 dB lower, the carry to noise gets worse by 1 dB. Uh, conversely, if the input goes higher, the noise can get better by 1, by, uh, 1 dB to 1 dB ratio. But don't hit it too hard because then you could wind up causing more distortions. Uh, distortions, composite triple beat is a two to one ratio for every one decibel change on the amplifier output, our distortions change by two decibels. So if my rated output is, like I said before, 36 over 44, and if I change that, increase that output by one dB, make it 37 over 45, my distortions have just grown by two decibels. My output went up by one decibel, but my distortions grew, got worse by two decibels. It's a two to one ratio. Cross modulation is a one and a half to one ratio. Um, again, that, that's not as prevalent as the, the, storage, the composite triple beat distortion. So here we have the same two amplifiers, 
um, that we looked at the carrier to noise example with. Now we're looking at the output side of the amplifiers. The rated output again, 3644 for both of these amps. The specifications for these amps, if you look at the spec sheets, for the BIDA 86A43P, the power doubling version of the amplifier, the distortion with a 3644 dBmV output is rated at minus 60 dB. So meaning the, any distortions created through this amplifier will be 60 decibels less than the uh, analog video carrier. For the 30 dB gain amp, amplifier number two, again, it's a power doubling amplifier. It's distortion rating at 3644 dBmV out is a minus 62 dB. So its distortions are a little bit better, rated 62 dB down from the video carrier. You can see the input level ratings there as well. So similar to the carrier to noise, figuring out the carrier to noise contributions, we find the deep decibel difference. We didn't have to calculate the distortions because we're running the rated outputs, so we have the, dis the rated distortions in our uh, specs. No calculations needed there. But we need to find the difference. The decibel difference, 62 minus 60, we find a 2.0 2 dB difference. So now we go, this time we're looking at a 20 log uh, D rate chart. The character noise, we were looking at a 10 log chart. Now we're looking at a 20 log chart, go down to two on the left column there, and across to the first 0 .00 column, and we find 5.08 for the D rate. So we take our lower distortion number, 60, minus 5.08, and we wind up with, after the second amp, we wind up with 54.92 dB uh, distortions, or, carry, or composite triple B. I, if I was designing a system and running these calculations, I would round it up and just call it 55 dB distortions. Every doubling of amplifiers drops my overall distortion by 6 dB. So if I have several 30 dB gain amplifiers in series, every time I double it from one to two amps, from two amps to four amps in series, my overall distortion drops by 6 dB. So if I have, let's say I'm looking at this Vita 86A30P amplifier here, and its distortion is rated at minus 62, and I run four of those in series in my system, four in series is two doublings, so uh, my overall distortion would drop by 12 dB after my fourth amplifier. So 62 minus 12 gets me down to 50 dB of distortions. FCC minimum for distortions in an analog system is a 50, minus 51. So I'd actually be out of, out of FCC spec on there. And again, they're not going to come looking for you. But my customers may not be too happy because my pictures may not be too good looking if my distortions are worse than the FCC spec. Okay. Now that was all talking about uh, analog carriers and analog distortions and so forth. Uh, distortion and noise in digital systems, digital carriers don't manifest the same way. Uh, distortion and noise together uh, ma manifest themselves as what they call composite intermodulation noise. So it's kind of a combination of noise and distortions together that they use to measure for the metrics of the health of a digital signal. That's again, a combination of composite intermod distortions, which would be equivalent to composite triple beat, composite second order, cross modulation in analog, the output side of the amplifier, um, the contributions to the, the performance of the signal and thermal noise, which is the input side of the amplifier. So again, even if we have a 100% digital system, we still need to balance that amplifier, get a reasonable input level into that amp, and run at or as close to specified output level as possible to maintain that balance and 
not contribute too much noise or distortion to our digital signals. Composite intermod noise will appear in a digital signal as an elevated noise floor. So here I've got a, on the right side there, I have a spectrum analyzer shot of a single quam carrier in black, and the green would be a representation of the noise floor getting elevated after having gone through an amplifier or two uh, to have those contributions added to the system. Composite intermodulation noise will decrease the MER, the modulation error ratio. That's one of the major metrics for digital signal. Modulation error ratio is measured uh, on a constellation meter. Uh, the the left-hand shot there at the bottom of the slide shows a constellation. That's a 16-point QAM-16 uh, constellation, but it, it, the same theory holds true for QAM-64, QAM-256. It's basically each one of those crosshairs is the target, and how far away from the target is the actual data point landing that's that difference, that distance is how much modulation error I have. Okay, so the more noise, the more distortion, the more composite intermod noise we have in our system, the further away from the targets we're going to be, the worse our MER is going to be, the lower quality the picture is going to be. In a digital picture, it doesn't show up as, as worminess or graininess or lines or anything. It's your picture is going to be perfect until it's starting to freeze and break up, get a little pixeling, and then totally freeze and be gone. So, MER at the drop. In a digital signal, it's all about MER at the drop, the modulation error ratio. The QAM signals leave the head end at about an MER of about 40. Anything it goes through, in the distribution system will contribute to lowering that MER number. Noise, again, noise on the input side of the amps, the nonlinear distortion from the output side of the amps. So we got to make sure the input and the output side of the amps are set up accordingly to minimize those contributions. Reflections, impedance mismatches in a system, improper or missing terminations on splitters, combiners taps, damaged coax cable, improperly installed F connectors, any of these things will, can and will interfere with a digital signal. Um, when we first started getting into digital, it was, well, digital is gonna be the great savior because the pictures are perfect, pictures are perfect until, you know, we don't have the, the, the gentle degradation of picture quality. Well, yes, that's true in a way, but the same issues that affect analog signals also affect digital signals. It's just that you don't have that slow, gradual uh, degradation of the quality. It gets bad, it gets bad, the picture looks great, but then at some point, it's just going to fail. They call that the cliff effect. So the picture is perfect until you hit that cliff, and then the picture just fails. So you want to main, maintain your system overall as well as possible, minimizing reflections, making sure there's no damaged cable, properly installed connectors, and so on, um, to, to stay as far away from the edge of that cliff as possible. And that cliff point, the failure point for QAM64 is about 22 decibels, and for QAM256, it's about 28 decibels when we're starting at about 40. So we don't have a, a ton of room to worry about before we hit that cliff. That cliff points when the forward error correction runs out of the ability to fix the errors. Um, and it's best to run with at least a 3 dB margin above the cliff point. You know, we, we design for as, per, as well as possible, you know, the amplifiers are a way of life. We have to have amplifiers to make our systems work, but just willy-nilly throwing amplifiers at a system doesn't, doesn't benefit the cause at all. It, it hurts more than it helps. Okay, so bit error rate. Bit error rate is the ratio of error bits to the total number of bits transmitted, received or processed, 
over a defined length of time. For example, if I have three error bits in a total of a million transmitted bits, it results in, you can see the, the numbers there, we call it three times 10 to the minus six. Okay, a lot of meters display it as something like three E minus six uh, is how our meters display it. So that's saying three errors in a million, basically. Okay, the modulation error ratio it's the ratio of average symbol power to average error power. And the error ratio is what is most, uh, what is most measured, what is most looked at when, when setting up a system and, and troubleshooting the system. And again, everything influences it, carotenoids, dis distortions, ghosting, amplitude tilt ripple. I mean, I, I could spend a day in going through breaking down each one of these different issues, but we don't have the time for that, and we're not going to get into all that today. Um, but here's a chart, and, and I'm pretty sure that this whole thing is going to be uh, put up on our website afterwards, so the, the, this will be available to review. But this chart here shows for 8DSD, QAM64, and QAM256, what the MERs are for an excellent quality picture all the way down to a non-functional picture. You can see that for QAM64, less than 23 is going to give you a non-functional picture. So you have about, um, what, 17 decibels from 40, so if you're starting at 40, about 17 decibels worth of garbage, if you will, that you can put on the signal to uh, before you get a failure. Um, but QAM 256, there's 256 points in that, in that constellation. They're much closer together. So there's less, anything less than a 30 MER on QAM 256 will be a failure. So there you only have 10 dB to, to work with. So your QAM 256 signal system needs to be much tighter than a QAM 64 system needs to be in order to work. Here we have a couple of constellation examples. These are QAM64 constellations, but QAM256 would look similar, just have more points to it. Uh, so number one is a good constellation. All of the data points are hitting the crosshairs of where they should or really close to. Uh, the second one is a phase shifted constellation. You can see if you look from the center of the constellation out, it looks like concentric rings working their way out, kind of like a target. Uh, that's usually from a residual FM signal getting into your equipment right in your head end. Something in the head end, in the racks of equipment, is throwing out stray FM signal and causing this. Your Composite triple beat, composite second order, your distortion constellation looks kind of like a, a a bullseye target around each target. It's not it's not exactly hitting. It's hitting all around each of the targets, but not hitting the target. And then the carrier to noise constellation, where you have too much noise in your system, is kind of like a buckshot. It's just a big scattering of uh, data hitting each of the target points. Here is uh, a couple of screenshots from our, one of our meters. It's the um, it's QAM 256, so you can see how many data points are in that constellation on the left. And on the right is a zoomed in quarter of that. The different colors just are indicating different passes through, just so it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad. It's just showing that at, at different cycles through the through the uh, constellation, it shows different colors just for uh, ease of viewing. And so this is an 8VSB, the off-air format, an 8VSB constellation. They sometimes call it a waterfall constellation. Uh, because it kind of looked, resembles a waterfall. It's eight vertical lines, uh, and how how closely the 
the data bits or to the center of each of those lines is how well that uh, quality of that signal is. So now measurement metrics. We'll talk a, a couple. Talk about a couple other things here. Um, so for analog systems, carrier to noise and composite triple beat are the primary measurement metrics for the he overall health of our system. This is a screenshot from one of our field strength meters. On the left, it's showing the level of the signal, 15.2 dBmV. On the right side, another one of the screens on that meter shows the audio video ratio on the top, and then it shows the carrier to noise of 44.7. So um, this one shows the carrier to noise, 44.7. Then you would use, you could also use a spectrum analyzer to see the composite triple beat, the distortions of the, uh, the that channel. For measuring distortions, you typically have to remove the video and audio information off the carrier for the meter to properly measure the distortions underneath the, uh, the video and audio information. Uh, but those are the two major uh, measurements that are done for analog signals in a uh, system. For digital systems, again, MER, modulation error ratio, and BER, bit error rate are the primary measurement metrics. You can use a digital field strength meter again, a QAM analyzer like this guy here on the left shows the power of the channel, minus 5.2 dBmV, shows the MER, the modulation error ratio is better than 40 dB. Um, so this must be pretty much directly out of uh, uh, a unit, not through a distribution system. Then it shows the noise margin. Uh, and then the last two lines are BDER and ABER. Those are before bit error rate and after bit error rate. So that's saying before I do any error correction, how much, how bad is my bit error rate? And after I do my bit error, my forward error correction, how bad is my BER? So it does a before and after check on that. And then it also there shows the constellation. So all those tools, um, we'll get more in depth on that in another uh, segment. And I believe that is all we have for the canned portion of this, uh, this slide presentation here, this webinar. So, Liz, do you have any um, common questions that maybe I can answer right now, or do you want to just wait and I'll answer them all in an email? Um, well, there's a couple questions. A lot of you have asked, are we going to share the slides, or is this um, going to be recorded? It is being recorded. We will be posting it on our website, as and the slides will be on our website as well. And when we, we will send you a link to those. Um, uh, uh, we will send you a link to that later on today. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, one just came in. Uh, is there such a thing as too many terminators in a system? Uh, no, no, there's not too, too many. Well, you can get over carried away and if a terminator is left too loose, it could be become more of a, a hindrance, more of an issue on a system than, than benefit the system. But for the most part, any splitter, any through line of a directional coupler or tap must be terminated if it's unused. Um, if you have a tap port it has enough isolation, does not necessarily need to be terminated. Uh, the test ports on amplifiers don't necessarily need to be terminated because they have enough isolation. But if you terminate it correctly, is that an issue? No. Okay. Um, why is 40 dB the max for MER? 
that is a that that gets into engineering practices um, that we'll just leave it as that's the theoretical maximum of MER in a digital signal. Okay, uh, where does forward error correction occur? Forward error correction happens in the digital tuner to an extent, a digital receiver. Um, the, there is bits of information included in the digital stream to tell the forward error correction device, the, the tuner, how to fix itself, how to fix that signal. So there, there is a limited amount of forward error correction inherent in every digital signal. And it, the error correction happens in the receiver, whether the receiver be a television, a set-top box, a, a processor, whatever. Um, cliff point is a measurement slash calculation of MER? That's correct. So, yes, let me go back to that slide real quick here, if I can get there without overshooting it. The cliff point here is, the, the quote unquote cliff point is basically the failure point of uh, the MER, yes. So it's MER measurement, and that's also shown on this chart here. So the non-functional line on this chart at the bottom would be considered the cliff point, the failure point of each of these types of signal. Um, one of our um, attendees has a specific example about our BT Quam Pro. Set up for analog or digital measurements. Does oh, I can't read my own writing? Uh, <laughs> does the meter measure the levels differently, or will the levels measure the same in either setup? If you have a mix of both analog and digital si signals, for our meters, you can uh, set it up to scan. If you have a mixed uh, a mixed format system. You can set our meters up to scan for analog and digital signals, and it will measure analog as analog signals and uh, the appropriate carrier to noise, composite triple beat, so on. And then it will measure digital signals as a digital signal and show you the MER, BER measurements for that. But you have to, you know, set it up accordingly. You can call in at a later time, and we can help you set that up. Okay. Um, so the same person says gets a lots of arguments that digital signals will work at levels far below what we recommend. Um, how do you deal with that? Is there a measurement such as BER increasing as the input levels are lowered or what? Yes, lo lower levels are getting closer to noise floor. So yes, your, your BER, your MER will be getting worse, will be getting lower. Um, uh, I agree. I have seen some television tuners accept a minus 20 and give a beautiful picture, uh, but that's less the norm. And, you know, uh, we're trying to give you guidelines for 99.9% .9 of devices on the market. So we don't want to say, you know, everything can accept a minus 20 dBmV input. We, we want to go with mainstream, middle of the road kind of levels. Yes, there's always going to be outliers either way, too low, lower or higher, that that some signals, some devices can accept. Okay. Um, should an amplifier of minus 30 dB output taps also be terminated? It, it does not have to be terminated because a 30 dB down, a minus 30 dB test port will lose, if your output is 44, your test port output is now 14, and then if it's open and if there's a reflection happening, it loses 30 dB again, so now it's down to a minus 16 before it starts interfering with any other signals. So the, the delta between the main signal 
and any reflected signal is 60 decibels difference. So essentially will not be an inter a significant interference. Okay. Um, would you please talk about the math of the CNR one more time? Sure. Let me back up the slides here. So, let's, no, too far. Okay, one more. Okay. So right here for a single amplifier, 59 is a thermal noise level of a 75 ohm resistor. That's just a engineering standard. Uh, if you take a a 75 ohm resistor and measure it across a network uh, analyzer, you would see that it has 59 dB of noise inherent just in that one component. All of our systems are rated for 75 ohm impedance. So that is our baseline. We know that 75 ohms starts with 59 dB of noise in and of itself. Then the noise figure of the amplifier is a spec that's given to us by the amplifier manufacturer. That's a spec for every amplifier is the noise figure. For our amplifiers, our Bita series amplifiers, our noise figure is 8.5. So 59 minus 8.5 brings us down to 50.5. Right off the bat without talking about input level. Now our input level directly affects the carrier to noise. So again, here seeing these three examples with a 30 dB gain, a 43, and a 50 dB gain amplifier, the 15 dB MV input on our uh, 30 dB gain amp will give us a resultant six, roughly 65 dB carrier to noise. If I didn't round off the numbers, it would actually be 65.5, right? Because 50.5 plus 15. Uh, 43 dB gain amp is about a 51 dB carry to noise. And the 50 dB gain amplifier with a minus 6 dB MV input is about a 44 dB carry to noise. I hope that answered the question. If not, you can drop me an email and I'll be happy to talk to you about it more. Um, in the case of analog modulators rated plus 55 dB BMV, where is the optimum setting? Well, what, on any of our devices, any of our products, analog, digital, we list, we may list a range. When we show the, the uh, noise and the distortions that this device generates, that's always at maximum level. So if if we have like the uh, an analog modulator that's rated at 55 dB output, dBmV output, and all you look at all the other specs on the spec sheet, all those specs are based on that that device running at 55 out. So typically, we run all of our devices at at maximum level. When we're balancing a head end. If we have a full head end, several racks worth of equipment, we typically start at the highest channel because that is the most difficult, highest frequency is the most difficult to set up. Start with that one, set it to the, to the highest rated output. Actually, we set it at rated output minus two. So we allow 2 dB so that if, any, if there's any discrepancies in the combining network or anything else, we can balance everything, set everything at like levels without going over our rated output. So if, if we're running at 55 out, a 55 dBmV product, we would set it to 53. Um, John Nichols has a question. Hi, in our system, 45 analog, three digital QAM. At first I put 2.2 in the analog channel 19 spot. I found that it would drop every once in a while. I then placed it in the 55 analog spot, and now it's perfect. Why do you think that happened? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I will have to answer that one offline, because I, I got to look at that 
and I, I didn't quite comprehend that. Okay. So I'll that's have fair. to look at that we'll and answer that, that you offline. Separately, John Nichols. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, is there a chart to find what frequency can be used, can be causing beats under a qualm carrier in a mixed system? Um, some of our older broadband reference guides did have charts showing how many beats were generated in each channel, but they didn't specifically say what channel the sources were. So typically, if I'm looking for an issue on a, on a distortion, a beat, I start looking at adjacent channels, number one. Look at the adjacent high and low channel. Then I look at double the frequency of this channel. And remember, this channel is 6 megahertz wide, so double both high and low frequencies for that channel and look at whatever channels are, are higher in that range and cut both high, high and low frequencies for that channel, cut them in half, and look at the two channels that are in that range. So again, it's adjacent channels, whatever's right next to it, and then double the frequency and half the frequency are typically going to be the most common culprits for generating distortions on a channel. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left. I'm going to try to get all of the qu other questions. What is the recommended dB level at TV tuners? At TV tuners, again, for analog, we want to see between 5 and 15 dBmV. And for digital, is minus 5 to plus 5 dBmV. Okay. Um, how closely do the analog or digital channels need to be balanced? What happens if they're not closely balanced? If they're not closely balanced, they can interfere with each other. That's that's the biggest headache um, by having a non-balanced system is channels interfering with each other. I know from personal experience, having seen, you know, by the time the cable company gets to a site, that signal is not perfectly flat. And then try to add a channel into that system, right? And you've got channels all over the place to begin with level-wise, and now you're trying to cleanly insert another channel. It can be a bit difficult. But getting it as flat as possible um, is, is helpful. I mean, what can happen if it's not flat? Worst case is the, the signals won't be recognized by the TV tuner if if they're too far out of whack, if they're too too great a difference between high and low levels going into a television tuner, it, it could wind up not recognizing some channels. Um, in a distribution network, is the choice to output QAM 256 or QAM 64 based on a regional standard, equipment standard, or just by design? So QAM 64 was the original a digital signal that was produced in the U.S. and it has the capability of 27 megabits per second roughly uh, of data ca ca carrying capability. QAM 256 has a capability of 38.8 .8 megabits per second so it can carry more data. Uh, it also is more finicky if you will. Um, it, it's has to be a little more, it's less tolerant of issues in the cable system. So if your system can support QAM 256, uh, you will benefit by using QAM 256 uh, better. You, you'll, you'll get more data throughput in a six megahertz channel slot. Uh, but, but if it cannot support it, you can run QAM 64 and still maintain providing digital and HD signals, just not as many. Would you set outputs at the combiner or launch AMP test port? port? I look at the directly off the uh, test port, output test port of the final combiner to ensure that all my combiner ports are, are correct 
you know, and, and getting, uh, combining all my channels together in, in the proper method, in the proper way. Um, looking at it on the input test port, trying to balance it there, uh, it's, I, I don't necessarily agree with. I, I would test it either at the output test port of a, of a combiner or put a 20 decibel tap in line between the final combiner and the amplifier to use as a test port. Okay. And our final question, what is the relation between MER and SNR on digital signal? Well, it's like asking what is CTB to carry the noise for an analog signal. MER modulation error ratio it measures the output metrics on on the output side of the amplifier. SNR measures the performance metrics on the input side of, of an amplifier. So again, uh, input side of the amplifier noise, output side of the amplifier distortions for Analog, it's carrier to noise. For digital, it's signal to noise. On the output side, it's composite triple beat distortions. And for analog, for digital side, it's MER on the output. And I think we'll be writing all, all you'll forward me the, all of these questions and I'll write them down as well, Liz, in an yeah. email. Yeah, we can take care of that or as something. well. Okay. okay. Well, Thank you all for uh, coming to our first ever BT webinar. Um, we will uh, be sending out a link to the presentation slides. Um, it will the recorded version of this webinar will also go um, on our website. Probably give us a day or so um, to get that done. And uh, we will be also um, we have two more on deck. And we always welcome all your thoughts and comments as other categories or other topics that you need to, um, to, to learn about. We're happy to provide you with uh, our expertise. BT has been around for such a long time and we stand for, for um, quality and we stand for just making sure that everybody has the best. We want to make sure that you have the best education possible. So thank you again and have a great day. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Okay. Bye.